Hey everyone, how's it going? In my last video, I explained and lamented how school turns us from shapeless masses with unlimited potential into identical wooden blocks of patriots. That video is required reading for this one, which means you're supposed to watch that one first, but if you don't, who am I to stop you? In that video, I laid out the basic problem with school. The, the way it teaches us to believe in authority, to obey people and rules, and think what we're told to think. All that turns us into the perfect citizens of the nation-state. We accept the limitations and injustices and the cruelties of the world, and worry about being able to survive without falling into poverty. There are reasons why we're so accepting of the world in the awful condition that it's in. Our indoctrination starts with school. I was actually thinking of skipping this video. The point of my last one was to get to the root of what school is and why it's bad for kids. The reason I decided to make this one is, as a teacher, I really wanted to get into some of the details of why school sucks for kids and teachers alike. But if you only watch this video, and not the last one, you might be under the impression I just want to reform school. I don't. I want to eliminate it. This video is about the secondary reasons why. It's common when people talk about social institutions like government or capitalism to say these institutions are failing. We've been told our whole lives government is meant to defend us and do what we want it to do. Capitalism is supposed to make us free and prosperous, and when those things don't happen, we naturally come to the conclusion these things are broken, or failing, or corrupted somehow. However, we really need to consider the possibility that these things are working precisely as they were intended. I made a video on why government isn't broken but functioning well, and you can watch it here. I thought school was another great example of such an institution, so here's this video. Now, in my experience, as soon as I say something sucks in public, someone pops out of nowhere to ask, so what's the alternative? Slow down. See, that's what's great about having a YouTube channel. I'll talk about our options for educating people in the next video in this series. Though, of course, you really just need the right keywords, and you can look it up for yourself. I'll be hinting as we go, but not going too deep this week. We need to diagnose a problem correctly before we know how to cure it. Saying schools are failing without any analysis invites us to throw more money into schools, or just change the teachers, or give more homework. Kids already have way too much homework. In this video, I'm going to try to convince you school is the greatest barrier to a child's education. What is the purpose of school? Is it to educate kids? What does that mean? Teach them useful skills? Teach them to thrive? Or at least teach them to negotiate the world as adults? Would any of those be acceptable definitions of an education? Because if we think that's what school should do, we have quite different priorities from the people who designed and run the school system. The purpose of school has never been to raise us up, but to dumb us down. Schools were designed to create docile, law-abiding, tax-paying, voting workers who don't know how to question anything the rich and powerful do. And it works. 
Most survivors of school in the U.S. are so inured to the system, they can't recognize an act of plunder and mass murder by the state they were trained to salute every morning. The people in power want workers who are completely dependent on the corporation or the corporate state to survive. That works too. The whole purpose of school in the minds of most parents has now become getting a job, renting yourself out to the capitalist class and expecting to starve to death in the street if you don't. They want consumers who trample each other to get the latest products that promise to distract them from their lives and think that's the way it's supposed to be. And perhaps most importantly, the point of school is to keep the vast majority, the people who lose out on the great game of capitalism, to teach them to accept their lot. We have millions of people who think poverty, their poverty, their oppression, their mental illness, their imprisonment, their unemployment, their confusion is all their own fault. School isn't broken or failing. It's working just fine. And the reason school reforms don't achieve anything is really the same reason reforming laws doesn't usually change anything. It accepts all the basic premises about the thing it's attempting to reform. Reformers don't ask, how can we get kids to want to learn about the world? How can we make kids strong, independent, and free? They ask, how can we force children to learn the things we say are important to learn by monopolizing their time and attention for most of the day? What's the right mix of rewards and punishments for that system? Punishments? That's not teaching, that's discipline. If you don't know the difference, you're not ready for education. Because we live in a capitalist world, schools compete with each other for students. And because we live in a capitalist world, we're informed by all authority that competition is good for us. In the race for pupils, schools advertise things like Join Sweetly Named Academy and unleash your child's creativity. But like most advertising, they're just trying to differentiate in a market that demands similarity. Sure, Coke and Pepsi aren't literally the same, just like Sweetly Named Academy is not exactly the same as glorified daycare elementary. But the fundamentals are the same. They have to be. Customers, in this case parents, that's what they expect. For instance, if a teacher didn't give their kids any homework, they would probably be chewed out by parents who don't realize that all studies on the subject have found that homework is not useful. Until something like late high school, homework is just a waste of time. A lot of the things I'm going to say in this video, I say to every parent and teacher I meet. Now, even if the teacher knows homework is not beneficial to students and wants to turn the class in the right direction, they can't. The administration and the parents wouldn't let them. And I know that because it happens all the time. Ask any teacher, or at least any teacher who's really dedicated. I've seen teachers with great ideas to inspire kids who want to implement you know, cool new ways of learning, but they get told to stop. Some of them have knowledge that contradicts the textbooks or the exams, but they aren't supposed to say it. What can they do? They're so restricted they're not even allowed to educate their students. Another example of a popular misconception related to school is that competition is good for us. It's not. It shouldn't be encouraged in school. Like the truth about homework, I was pretty surprised to learn all this, but again, look at all the studies you like on this subject and you'll find nearly all of them agree competition brings zero benefit to children. Competition makes winning the only goal and fun incidental. 
So if you had fun and lost, it wasn't worth it. Or if you had fun and you won, you could allow yourself to feel good about having fun. Competition hurts relationships, discourages cooperation, encourages win-lose thinking rather than win-win thinking, along with mistrust, envy, and contempt. It puts pressure on children to succeed. How do you think they feel when they fail? So it stresses us all out, and no, it does not improve performance. I'll leave a link or two in the description so that you can check this out for yourself. You could say competition in school conditions us for a capitalist society where everyone is expected to compete with everyone else and to lose out on everything if we're not good enough. But why would that be the society we were trying to create? How about a society where we see each other as equals, not, not rivals to be bested? Where we value cooperation to reach our common goals? Where we don't abuse our children because they're not as good at something than other children of the same age? And where we don't feel like we or others deserve less because our labor or our minds aren't valued as highly by the people with all the money? Not everyone can be an A student or a gold medal winner. That doesn't mean there's something wrong with the kids. Performing within the narrow confines of the institution, kids' only concern is to get good grades. And since that isn't possible for everyone for various reasons, it's inevitable that some kids will be made to feel like failures, like they're inadequate. Why do we rank students? What's the point of saying which children are better than others? To give parents bragging rights? I'm not impressed that your kids are better at following rules and repeating things they heard than the other kids. Employers don't seem to care about grades and exam results and honors programs. Maybe we rank because universities have limited space. So only people who can prove they've been sufficiently trained get in. That's supposed to be our goal in school, even though the system ensures a large number of us will fail to achieve it. And the reason we don't question institutions like school and homework and grades and tests is it's normal for us. We went through it, so they should. It reflects our failure to question things when true education would teach us to question everything. In school, there's a focus on finding answers to specific questions without knowing whether or not we're asking the right questions. Only answer. Don't think about what's important for yourself and ask and answer questions. Just answer my questions and pass the test. Just get the assignment done hand it in, and bask in the glow of the letter your teacher writes on it later. How is that even useful for children? How are they supposed to learn? That's not feedback. Children's learning doesn't have to have definite answers, and it certainly doesn't be, have to be graded. They should be able to ask and find the answers to their own questions and then ask more and bigger questions and keep seeking. That way they can explore their passions without the pressure of learning specific things and forgetting everything else because authority told you that's the thing that matters. And I expect you know this already, but learning things out of interest is much easier than learning because you were coerced. So even for those kids who do well in school, they're still only prepared to do basic tasks like reading and math. It doesn't teach them to think. It teaches them to accept. Accept what your teachers say. Accept what historians say. Accept what textbook publishers say. We don't have time to question anything this semester. Perhaps that's how schools kill creativity and critical thinking and teach us to accept the status quo. 
Kids tend to test very high for creativity. But every year, school kills their imagination and reduces their creativity a bit more. Again, there are studies, and you can see from the links in the description. But it's not just creativity and critical thinking. The structured, scheduled nature of school means kids need to turn on and turn off their enthusiasm every hour, rather than using it as the basis of their exploring a subject. The end of class is an ending that has to be recreated tomorrow, rather than being the beginning of the child's learning. They could learn something from me, then go out and do it. Let them spend all day on it. Let them spend all week on it. They can do something else later. But the school has to fit everything and everyone into a rigid schedule. So it has to be ordered. And round-pegged humans have to be hammered into square holes. All kids are potential geniuses in multiple subjects. But geniuses need time to study what they like, to learn to work independently and make mistakes. We should stop making kids afraid to fail. Most of what they learn in school is useless anyway, and they're going to forget it. Why lie to them and tell them otherwise? Because you want them to get good grades? It means nothing for their future, okay? In fact, as somebody who usually got good grades and was told he was smart, I can safely say doing all that sets people up for disappointment later in life, if not depression. Schools and parents just flat-out lie to kids about their future, just like they lie to them about just, ev just about everything else. We're going to be handing them a world full of smoke and plastic and violence, and telling them to use Shakespeare and algebra to clean it up. They could be learning to work together, to identify problems and find solutions, but instead they're separated and told to compete to see who can learn more trivia. It's such an incredible waste of their time. And it's not really surprising to me that so many people attack Greta Thunberg by saying she's only 16, so what could she know? On the surface of it, they make a good point. Schools are so woefully inadequate, it's hard to believe that a product of them could actually know what they're talking about. But Greta and other activists are getting a better education now than they ever will in school. When they learn petitioning the state to work against the rich is a dead end, then they'll be ready for solutions. Here's another thing that bugs me about school. There's a stigma that in public school, um, because if you're older, you should be ashamed to be in a lower level. You know, we even use the word fail. You failed a grade. But everybody learns different things at different rates. You get labeled slow or special ed or, again, a failure, or a candidate for drugging because you don't learn well by sitting in a desk all day. <laughs> it's almost like you're human. In fact, that setting guarantees kids will get up to things other than the topic of their class because they're with their friends. But the point is, it does students a disservice to put people of different levels in the same class. The only ones who get any real benefit from that are the ones who are just at the right level that's being taught. But there are students who aren't at that level and who don't learn that way. What about them? They'll fall behind and get ranked low and made to feel like shit, because that's what ranking does. And what about the kids who've already learned this stuff? They're bored. They could be doing so many more useful things with their time, including the thing that they're good at, 
but at a higher level. I teach in the private sector, and because we're not bound by the same unnecessary rules as public school, we put people into classes based on proficiency. If you're a beginner, you go with the beginners. It doesn't matter how old you are. And by the way, in my experience, older students tend to have a maturing effect on the younger ones. Nor does school give us much time for socializing, except in the strange jungle of school itself, where kids are taught to feel like insiders and outsiders, to bully or be bullied. And that's why it's pretty ironic when people ask homeschoolers how their kids learn to socialize. Unless the parents are like, you know, religious fanatics and that's why they homeschool, which is a pretty small percentage, the kids are probably more mentally healthy than most of their peers. Speaking of bullying, do you think maybe the, the competitive hierarchical nature of school might be one reason there's so much bullying going on there. The way it seems necessary to dominate people, to make, to make students feel better about themselves because of the way school has made them believe they're inadequate. Hurt, broken people often try to hurt and break others. Those kids grow up and don't learn any better, so they go out and harass people on Instagram and Twitter and try to make them kill themselves. If they weren't made to feel inadequate and afraid at school and at home, by the way, equally important, they wouldn't be so keen to take out their frustrations on others. If those others learned to unite and cooperate on their common interests, they could defend each other. Students and teachers alike should expect everyone to treat each other with respect and intervene if it's not happening. They could devote whole discussions, school discussions, or at least class discussions, to preventing it. I don't know about your school, but we didn't do anything like that in mine. I don't think there are more than a handful of people directly to blame for the state of school. Teachers don't usually realize how hamstrung they're going to be by the system when they enter it. The incentives teachers in a public school system have are not to teach critical thinking and create a new generation of rebels. Their incentives are to appear as the wise one who knows all, only allow certain questions and certain answers and certain material to be taught, and otherwise focus on marks, which is part of this lie we tell children about how it's important for them to get good grades because exam results will dictate their future. We pressure them to compete and succeed when the only thing we give them as a vision is the prospect of leaving school and not having to do it anymore. We can do so much better. And I think that's all that had to be said about why school and education are not synonymous. Next week, I'll be talking all about how we can give people real education. See you then.